<laughs> My bride and I have tried that. <laughs> Let me invite us to open our Bibles to Ephesians, the, sec- the first chapter, Ephesians chapter 1. Be our third study thus far in this little brief epistle. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians, the first chapter, we'll be looking at verses 15 through 23 in a moment. While you're turning the place to that place, may I ask you a couple of questions just as a slight introduction to the text. You need not uh, verbalize it, but let me ask the question. Since you've said yes to Jesus Christ, do you have a realization of what we have in Christ? Do we fully realize what we have in our salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul has already spoken of the fact in the first chapter and the third verse that we're blessed in heavenly places with all of the blessings that's available to us. In the verses 3 through verse 14 that we've looked at, which is one sentence in the Greek text, and the Apostle Paul started with the what we have in Christ, and then he wrapped it up in the 13th and 14th verses. After that, you've heard the truth of the gospel and believed. So all of the blessings that we have come after we've said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. And may I remind us also, it's an interesting fact, and it's not necessarily germane to our understanding today, but verses 15 through 23 is also just one sentence. So other than the first two verses in chapter 1, with the introduction from the Apostle Paul to the believers at the church at Ephesus, uh, there's two sentences, Paul's long sentences, in the entire first chapter. Keep in mind, as I've said so many times before, the original text did not have verse and chapter divisions. We put them there, human beings, man put them there. And I've usually said for the past 50 years plus that I believe we have divided the Bible into verse and chapter divisions because of lazy Christian readers. We do not want to take time to read all of the verses. And sometimes a person will start reading and say, man, look at those verses in that chapter and stop about halfway through before we get the full understanding, the full impact of what God is saying to us through his word. But I believe much too often we fail to recognize what we have in Christ. We fail to recognize the promises and the power that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ in salvation. And in this text that is before us, the Apostle Paul is praying for the saints at Ephesus that they might have a full recognition and a full realization of what they have in salvation. May we hear with hearts to heed what Paul is saying in this intercessory prayer for the believers. Though it was written for the church at Ephesus, its application is to every believer, even to this very moment. Stand, if you will, please, out of honor and recognition of the reading of the word. As I read audibly, follow with me in your scripture silently. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, and we read these words. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him in his own right hand in in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every every name, uh, every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Thank you, and we may be seated. There are two basic points that I want us to understand in these few moments that we have together. 
Two basic points. I want us to look at the cause of his prayer revealed in verse 15 and 16 and the content of his prayer recorded in verses 17 through 23. And keep in mind, this is the Apostle Paul as he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. He's in prison. This is one of the prison epistles. He's in prison in Rome and he's writing this uh, letter. Some believe it to be a circular letter where it's uh, uh, circulated through the other churches of Asia Minor of that era, but it's written specifically to the church at Ephesus where he is wanting them to know that he is so thankful for them and what they have done and saying yes to Jesus Christ and then what we have in Christ after we've said yes to him and he is praying that they further might have their knowledge and understanding of what they have increased in Jesus. Notice the cause of his prayer revealed. First of all, we see the commending praise. Notice in verse 15, Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. After the long sentence that we've spoken of in verses 3 through 14, where Paul outlines for us all that we have in our salvation, our blessings, and all that we have in the heavenly places, then after that, notice there, the, verse 15, Wherefore, I also, after I heard, after he heard what? After he heard of their faith in Jesus Christ. After he heard of what they had done, going back to the previous uh, sentence or two, uh, verse or two in particular, after I heard that you have uh, believed in the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and placed your faith and trust in him as Savior. And now after that, after your salvation, and now the apostle Paul is pouring out his heart in praise for the believers of Ephesus. Remember, Paul's in prison. Remember, he's not with them. Remember, he cannot be with them to visit them. He cannot minister to them in person, but he can have fellowship in their midst through his prayer for them in relationship to what he is asking God to give them. But he could write to them and praise them for the report that he's received about their relationship to Jesus and what they're doing in following the Lord Jesus Christ. He reminds them also of his prayer for them, and Paul prays that here his, uh, I made the little marginal note, his pen is powerful and perhaps just as powerful as his preaching as he writes to them in the encouragement, encouraging words. First of all, what does he praise God for in them? Notice two things. First of all, their trust in the Savior. Their trust in the Savior. After I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, Paul praises them for saying yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. Let's go back and read that 13th verse for a little clearer, uh, clearer understanding. In whom, referring back to verse 12, and that is of Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Uh, there's a major, major need today for Christians to understand that we're not saved by osmosis. We're not saved by being a Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, or any other denomination. We're saved by placing our faith and trust in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We're saved by saying yes to that shed blood that was spilt on Calvary's cross for your sins and for mine. And he is praising them in his prayer. He is, first of all, praising them for their trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. Remember, in the previous verses, the unit of thought, verses 3 and following, where we have heavenly blessings, and we're already seated in heavenly places with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he talks about in the previous verses where we have, we've been adopted, we've been uh, chosen, as uh, children of God. We've been predestined to serve him. That's not talking about predestination under salvation, as we've said so often in relationship to what the text is really saying. There are a lot of people that get a misunderstanding, and they do so about the Scripture because of reading a verse or two, picking up the word predestination, chosen and elected, and trying to say that somehow, some way, that God did that before the foundation of the world. The predetermination of God in his sovereign foreknowledge is that we be conformed to the image of Christ after we've said yes to him as Savior and as Lord. And the Apostle Paul here is praising them for their trust and their faith in Jesus Christ. One of the things that's so needed today is to have the full gospel preached to the any audience, any congregation, to recognize that we're not saved by osmosis. We're not saved by being any good person. There are a lot of good people that are going to die and go to hell. 
In fact, in Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses 20, 21, 22, and 23, there are a lot of folks in that day, the day of judgment, that will say unto Jesus, Lord, Lord, that word Lord is curios, means owner and master controller. Lord, Lord, have we not done great works in your name? Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? But Jesus says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. There is the high probability that multitudes today that think that they're saved, that believe that they're saved simply because they're doing good works, because they're doing good deeds, because they're in church, because they're giving a tithe, because they're talking about Jesus, and even perhaps reading the Word of God, that think that because of that, somehow, some way, that will in uh, a fashion cause them to be good enough before God to go to heaven. That simply does not work that way. Salvation, God thought it. Salvation, the Holy Spirit wrought it. Salvation, Jesus Christ bought it. And the only way we can have that salvation, that's a free gift. A gift is not a gift until received. A gift is not a gift until accepted. And so the Apostle Paul is praising them that they've accepted that free gift under salvation. They've said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. May I remind us when we say yes to Jesus Christ, we're adopted into the family of God. We're redeemed to receive that seal of promise that is uh, given to us in this text in the earlier verses. And then in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, it says after we're saved, we're sealed until the day of redemption. A seal indicates ownership. A seal indicates uh, protection. A seal indicates relationship. And here we find the Apostle Paul praising them, those at uh, Ephesus, because they've said yes to Jesus Christ. After I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, he's praising them in his prayer. He's praising them for their trust in the Savior. Not only he's praising them for their trust in the Savior, but for their treatment of the saints. Notice the treatment of the saints. Notice he says, and love unto all the saints. Love unto all the saints. You know, uh, somebody said a number of years ago that it's wonderful thing about we get to heaven we'll be with all the saints in heaven but there's a problem all times just having a love for the saints here on earth there's a major problem many times in many lives where we cannot get along with others but may i say according to the word of god we need to have a relationship through jesus christ first of all with god through jesus and that relationship causes us to love the brethren in the faith if there's not a love for others, it's a good indication according to uh, 1 John 3 and 14. That's the indication that we're saved if we love the brethren. The main indicator of our salvation is love one for another. Now, I'm not talking about that sloppy agape where a person can be say that I'm saved and live a life away from God, living a life of uh, uh, sin unto uh, death, and uh, somebody somewhere needs to understand that because I love you does not mean I'm to embrace your sin. We have the responsibility as Christians to love the brethren enough that we'll confront them in sin. I am saddened when I see so many today with that mindset that all love is okay. Even if it's in the realm of sodomite lifestyle, they're saying that that's love and God wants us to love and therefore that must be all right. It's simply not so biblically. A lot of folks today that will uh, think that somehow, some way, we're to embrace their lifestyle, that we're to uh, celebrate their lifestyle. I was saddened this past week when our sheriff's department had uh, sent out an internal memo to all of the deputies, all the police officers, that they were to be involved in the sodomite parade that was held in this city yesterday. They were going to have two uh, deputies, two sheriff's cars that's paid for, bought and paid for, and the, uh, if you please, the maintenance and upkeep and the gasoline by the taxpayers with two police officers behind the steering wheel in full uniform and then 50 police officers to be marching in the parade. Can you imagine the kids that were watching that, any moms and dads that will let their child see that, and because there's a police officer in full uniform with badges on, those kids will grow up thinking, well, it must be all right to have that uh, perverted lifestyle because the police officer is in that parade, so therefore it must be all right. It is not all right. And yet there are those that say, well, if we love them, we will embrace that and celebrate their sin. That's not what Paul is talking about here. He is talking about in the body of Christ where we love each other, we pray for each other, we hold each other's hands up, but when one falls in sin, we are loving them enough that we will confront that sin and pray that God will deliver them from that sin. Love does not mean that we should not confront. Paul, you recall, in Acts chapter 15, Paul confronted Peter. Peter was two-faced. 
Peter would be holy with the holy and terror with the terrors, as you'd call it today. Peter would sit with the Jews, and if he was sitting with the Gentiles, and a Jewish person walked in in the uh, council at Jerusalem in the 15th chapter of Acts, and Paul saw that two-facedness, and Paul confronted him publicly before the other brethren, the Scripture says, because he loved him. He would not allow him to do that. May I remind us, Paul loved the believers at Ephesus, and they loved all the other saints, and Paul was just rejoicing because he had received word of their faith in Jesus Christ and their love for the brethren. He, we see his commending praise, but notice in verse 16, his constant prayer, his constant prayer. Notice where the 16th verse starts, cease. It's understood Paul is talking about himself. I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention in mention, mention of you in my prayers. The Apostle Paul says, I am constantly praying for you. Notice the two things that he's praying for them about. He's thankful. Cease not to give thanks for you. Paul says, I pray, and when I pray, I'm saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving Susie. Thank you for saving Johnny. Thank you for saving Jim. Thank you for saving those at Ephesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you that we see their numbers increasing, that we see others that have faith today as a result of their lives impacting others' lives, that others might come to know Christ as Savior and as Lord, others minded. You might recall the founder of the Salvation Army, Colonel Booth, at one of the major conferences many years ago when they had the old theaters, the huge platforms, and the elongated auditorium. Colonel Booth was to address the meeting of all the Salvation Army members that year. The curtain is drawn. The shears are shown. Behind the shears you could see on that large wood platform a single microphone standing in the center of the platform. The shears open. Everyone seated with bated breath for Colonel Booth to walk out to be able to give the address. Silence fills the auditorium. Up walks a Western Union lad with an envelope. He stands in front of the microphone. He snaps the envelope open, and he says, Colonel Booth could not be here this evening, but he sends his address to this audience. And as he opened the envelope and he pulled out the telegram, he read one word on that page, others, closed it, put it back in the envelope, and left the platform. The message to the audience that evening was to be others-minded. And the Apostle Paul was others-minded, and he was praising them for their relationship to Jesus Christ and praising them for their others-mindedness, that they loved the brethren in Christ, that they were concerned about others, and were pra- they, he was praising them and thankful for them. And he says, I cease not to give thanks for you always. And it's because of their thoughtfulness. Notice there, making mention of you in my prayers. Paul, when he prayed, he didn't say, Lord, give me a job. He wasn't saying, God, help me with this and help me with that. Paul's prayers, as you go back and you look at multitudes of the other epistles that he had written, in every one of his epistles, someplace at the early portion of that epistle, he lets them know, I am praying for you. I am praying for you. I am praying for you. And that's what he's saying to them here. He's saying, I'm thankful for you. And I am thankful for you because of your thankfulness and also his thoughtfulness of having them in his prayers. How today should we pray? Should we pray and asking for things? I've said so many times, I believe most Christians look at God as a miracle water of some type, a holy horseshoe or divine rabbit's foot, where God is looked at as just simply being a water boy. God give me this and God give me that and God give me the other and God give me the other and it's simply give me, give me, give me, give me. Most kids grow up with that mentality and I think even as adults, many continue to have that mentality. The Apostle Paul, as he has that commending praise for them and then that constant prayer, he's praying for them and he's thankful for them. He's thankful for them and he is also thoughtful for them of what they're doing. He never forgot those that he had led to faith in Jesus Christ and now he's far away. He's in prison in Rome and he mentions them in his prayer, continuing to call their name before the throne of God. I don't know of anything greater than to have the confidence that others are praying for you.
I don't, I don't love anything any more empowering than to know that others are praying for you as we serve the Lord. Notice not only do we see the cause of his prayer revealed, but I want you to notice in verses 17 through 23, the bulk of the text, the content of his prayer recorded. It is outlined as nothing else could be in any part of Scripture. It is absolutely what I call the glory hallelujah text where we find what I call the fourfold prayer request of the Apostle Paul for those at Ephesus. Notice, first of all, for Christ's person revealed. Verse 17, in the fourfold prayer request of the Apostle Paul, he is praying that Christ's person be revealed. How are we, how are we to know the Lord Jesus Christ after salvation? Notice through his word that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. There are a lot of folks that will mangle this text, misunderstand this text, make this text say some things that it does not say in relationship to those words there, that the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge. But I want to stand, stand, understand something. God has given us the word, his inspired, infallible, inerrant word that we might know him and know him in his fullness. His word is the only way we're going to know him. His will is going to be found through his word. Multitudes of folks say, well, preacher, how do I know what God wants me to do? Uh, I've simply said, do you have a Bible? Yes. Do you read it? No, I don't have time. If you don't have time to read it, you'll never know the will of God. The will of God is found in the word of God, and the way of God for our lives is only found in the written, revealed, inspired, infallible, inerrant word. We will never know him fully outside of his revelation of himself through his word. Contrary to Beth Moore's recent statement that if you think you're going to know God better by knowing his word, you're just simply mistaken. Well, I want, to know, I want you to understand she's simply mistaken. It is, you know, mistaken, may I should, maybe I should say, rather mistaken. Because the only way we'll know God is through the word of God. God's word is the revelation of himself to man. And the more we study the Word, the more we know God. The more we uh, look at the Word, meditate upon the Word, and allow the Word of God to hide, uh, be hidden in our hearts, the more we are drawn closer to Him in the knowledge of Him through His Word. There's no other way that we can know God any better than through His Word. And it's the Holy Spirit that gives us the discernment. It's through the Holy Spirit that gives us wisdom to know His Word. As we study His Word, it's the Holy Spirit that then reveals the truth of His Word to our hearts and in our lives. It's the Holy Spirit that gives that discernment. It's the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit alone that can give us wisdom. Man's wisdom is earthly, sensual, and demonic, the little book of James tells us. But God's wisdom is from heaven. It is heavenly wisdom, and that's the wisdom that God gives us through his word. You can't just open the Bible uh, as any other book. We must allow the Holy Spirit of God to open our eyes and to reveal God's truth through his word. Christ's position revealed through his word, and secondly, through his works. Through his works, notice Paul says, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. As we see who God is through Jesus Christ, as we look at knowing God more intimately through the relationship that we have through the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, most of the human problems, most of the human difficulties, most of what we find that is so awesome and so frightening so often can dissipate if we simply stay in the word. Someone said on one occasion that for those that worry a lot, it is interest on a debt that may never come due. Most of, the time, most of the time we want to worry, 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 rather than looking at the Word of God and see what God's Word says about the issue that we're dealing with and what God's Word says in relationship to how we should respond to it. Most of that which we find today that in life, from the human standpoint, is so frightening and so scary, can dissipate if we simply stay in the Word. Notice, this text, do you have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him? If the answer to that is no, then we need to get in the word. It is knowing the truth of the word of God. Our salvation can provide it through the meditation on his word. You recall in the book of Joshua, the first chapter, verses 6 through 9 of the unit of thought, where God's telling Joshua, he's just called him to stand up, get up, and lead the children of Israel into the promised land. He says, meditate in the word, stay in the word. Don't go to the left, don't go to the right, but stay in the word of God. And that's the only way he could promise Joshua that he'd have great success in doing what he called him to do, if he stayed in the word. 
The only way there can be any modicum of what we would call biblical success today, not talking about success as the world calls it, but success in what God has called us to do is in and through the Word of God. Nothing more and nothing less. We, the Christ person is revealed through His Word and through His works. Only salvation can provide that. Not only do we see he's praying for Christ's person to be revealed, but also for Christ's provision to be realized. Christ's provision to be realized. Look at verse 18. Paul says there, For the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Let me just pause there for a moment. Being, he's referring back to what has happened when they got saved. He's referring back to a past tense of what had taken place with the continuing uh, emphasis on that enlightenment. The eyes of of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What or who would be that believer's hope? Two or three things I want us to see. First of all, Christ is our hope. Christ is our hope. Paul prays for the believer's eyes of understanding to be open and enlightened that we may comprehend to know what is the hope of his calling. What is that hope of our calling? Titus 2.13 gives it very, very clearly. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. There is that blessed hope that we have, and that hope is found in nothing more and nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. In fact, there's an old song that says, Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ's blood and righteousness. That's the only hope that we have. Anything else is no hope at all. In fact, may I remind us, our only hope is in Jesus Christ who died for us and shed his rich red royal blood on Calvary's cross for our sins forgiveness. When we say yes to Jesus Christ, something grand and something great takes place and it's beyond everything or anything that the mind could ever conceive or believe possible. I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man that which God has prepared for them that love him. We cannot comprehend what is in the blessed hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot comprehend the breadth and the depth and the fullness of what God has for us. Someone said on one occasion, by illustration, a person walking down the hallways of heaven and the angel is walking through, and there's doors and doors, and one of the doors is closed, and the person walking says, what's in that behind that door? And he opens the door, and he says, there's just boxes after boxes after boxes still wrapped and not opened. He said, what is that? He said, that's all the blessing, the benefits that Christians never opened. Many times, many times, the blessings and the benefits that we have in Jesus Christ are never open. We never accept them. We never go to the point of saying, Lord, I can't, but you can. And here the Apostle Paul is talking about our Christ being our hope. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. May I remind us our hope in Christ goes beyond this life. It stretches into all of eternity. Without him, there's no hope, no help. And as the old song says, without him, we'd surely fail. Without him, we'd be like a ship without a sail. Christ in our life gives us hope. Do you know him? Let's pause for a moment and think. Can you recall a point in time and place when you said yes to Jesus Christ, when you invited Christ to come in, you said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and save me. Help me to live for you because you died for me. Ladies and gentlemen, I want us to understand salvation does not come by osmosis. Salvation does not come by being a good person. Salvation does not come because back and back and back and back and back before the foundation of the world, God said you're going to heaven and you're going to hell. That's not the way salvation comes. Salvation is by choice, a volitional decision to say yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. And lest we do that, we're lost and on our way to a devil's hell. Without him... There's no hope. So he is praying for Christ being our hope and not only Christ our hope, but Christ our heritage. Notice in verse 18, the latter portion. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. May I remind us, our salvation provides an inheritance. 
Our salvation, when we say yes to Jesus Christ, provides us with a heritage, and that heritage is for us there in glory. And it goes back to the third verse where we're seated in heavenly places with all the heavenly blessings of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you study the book of Romans in the eighth chapter, you find that all that God has promised to Jesus Christ is also available for us because we're heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And that joint heir relationship was understood in the Roman culture that whatever one heir gets, the other gets. And so Jesus Christ, with all of the blessings and glory, is also for you and for me if we've said yes for Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. The Holy Spirit seals us, and that seal gives us the guarantee of God's blessings and provisions waiting for us in glory. As far as the Lord is concerned, they're ours now. Positionally, they're ours now. We already have the possession of those blessings in heavenly places. But may I ask the question, we are also his inheritance. Do we recognize that? Do we recognize that we ought not to be going around as paupers, but recognizing that we're king's kids. <laughs> and as king's kids, we have available to us all of the blessings of the Lord Jesus Christ that he's promised to us. God has no inheritance vested in the lost. His work of salvation gives us value and worth is all in who we place our trust in, and that's Jesus Christ. Our value is determined by Christ's precious blood in us. When we say yes to Jesus Christ, his shed blood covers us as though we had never sinned. This is the reason we talk about the fact justification is just as if I'd never sinned. Because when we say yes to Jesus Christ, we, our sin is cast as far as the east is from the west. It's flung into the deepest sea, and it is for, uh, remembered no more. It is flung it is forgotten and forgiven when we say yes to Jesus Christ. Have you done that? Do you know Christ is Savior? Have you invited him to come into your heart and through his shed blood cover your sins? Do we realize or comprehend all that we have? The Apostle Paul here prays that the saints of Ephesus would be enlightened and know all the beauty and the blessings in Christ Jesus. Christ's person revealed and Christ's provision realized. He's also praying that Christ's power be recognized in verse 19 through 21. Paul continues here with this passionate prayer. Keep in mind, this whole text is Paul praying for the saints at Ephesus, and it's applicable to us today. The passionate prayer for those saints, that they might know, experience, experience, more the power of Christ. Notice he says in that 18th, 19th verse and following, and what is the exceeding, that is superabundance, incomparable abundance and greatness of his power to usward who believe. And it's going back to the 13th verse. That's everything is hinged on that. After that you've heard the truth of the gospel and believed. And after he says that, then he's talking about that superabundance of blessings in Christ Jesus, according to that little word, kata, according, kata, based upon the working of his mighty power. It's his mighty power, his strength that's put forth with effect, if you will, that provides our soul's salvation. It's free, but it's not cheap. Salvation is free, but it's not cheap. It costs the Lord Jesus Christ everything. For your sins, forgiveness, and for mine. He put forth his power with the effect of salvation to all who by faith believe in the shed blood of Christ on Calvary. His mighty power. Notice, not only do we see in that text, he's praying for their recognition of what God has given them through Jesus but notice it's demonstrated in that 20th verse, which he, speaking of Jesus, wrought, that's made known, in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Notice, let me just give you an overview of what that contains. Let me just give you an overview of what Paul is talking about when it's demonstrated, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. You remember this uh, uh, theological doctrinal chronology? The Lord Jesus Christ is caught He's tried, he's convicted, and he's crucified on the cross. He's bruised and beaten, berated for your sins and for mine. 
He was scourged until hardly recognizable. A crown of thorns were crushed down on his head. That cruel, callous, cold Roman nails were then driven into his hands and his feet. He's hung on the cross to die. And afterwards, in that agonizing cry, Jesus hung there with his uh, 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 life's blood flowing out of his body. And he there was preparing a place for you and for me. His body was removed, lovingly prepared and placed into that rock-hewn tomb. The entrance was covered with a seal. The guard was placed at the tomb. But on that third day, up from the grave he arose. He arose having victory o'er his foes. Jesus Christ is alive. He's alive. He's alive. And here the apostle Paul is praying that the believers at Ephesus would recognize the power that they have in Christ Jesus. We go around acting as though we're, uh, in, uh, it's an impossibility for us to do anything or accomplish anything. The mindset that somehow, some way, we're simply paupers rather than recognizing that we're plugged into the power source of all of the universe. If we've said yes to Jesus Christ, as Savior and as Lord, all in the demonstration of his power. God demonstrating his power through Jesus Christ. Now, I don't comprehend it. I can't fully understand it. But as a recipient of that love, I can tell you that salvation is that which God can do through those that say yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. Not only its demonstration, but I want you to notice its distinction. It's distinction. Notice in verse 20, the latter portion in verse 21. Notice what the scripture says. And set him, speaking of Jesus, at his right hand in heavenly places. Verse 21. Far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named only, not only in this world but also in that which is to come. Listen to what Paul is saying. He's saying it's by the power of God through Jesus Christ, God incarnate, that rose in victory, ascended to heaven, and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. Some misunderstand that doctrinal theological truth. When we get to heaven, there won't be three thrones where there's God the Father and the Son, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You know, Islamics make fun of in fact, in the Noble Quran, the last 20 to 22 pages in the Noble Quran, they literally eviscerate Christianity and the Word of God, make fun of and mock the Word of God. They claim that because we talk about the triune Godhead, the triunity of the Godhead, we call it the Trinity. They make fun and say that Christians worship three gods, and they talk about that in a laughable sense. Even make fun and say that uh, Allah didn't have a son. He wasn't even married. How could he have a son? So therefore, they reject and refuse to understand and call Jesus Christ God come in the flesh. When we get to heaven, there'll be one seated there. His name is Jesus Christ. He is God come in the flesh. And it's through the power of God. Now, I'll never understand it. Human mind cannot conceive it. Human mind cannot comprehend it. But here's God that's in heaven that says because of a sinner that he's going to come in the form of man, and he did. He died on the cross, and he shed his rich red royal blood for your sins and for mine, that by our faith and trust in that finished work on Calvary that we can have eternal life, everlasting life. And understand that here's Jesus Christ that has the power over all principalities and powers on the face of this earth. In fact, in Colossians chapter 1, beginning with verse 15 through 18, who is the image? And it's speaking of Jesus, referring back to the previous two verses. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him, God, because of by him, speaking of Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, or principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he, speaking of Christ, is prost before all things, and by him things, all things consist. He's the divine superglue that holds it all together. And he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And then you find in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, and in the twelfth verse, 
The Apostle Paul talking about we wrestle not against uh, flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And here in this text in the first chapter of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul in his prayer for the uh, believers at Ephesus, he's pointing out that here's the Lord Jesus Christ. For uh, Notice in that 21st verse again, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. He's put Put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things the church. It is the Lord Jesus Christ that has the super dominant power. It is Christ that holds this world together. It's Jesus Christ that created everything that's visible and invisible. It's Jesus Christ that when you find in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the God that created the heavens and the earth, and everything that's in it is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Look at what we have in our salvation. Look at who we serve as we say yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. He is above the principalities and the powers, and that's talking about all of Satan's rule and Satan's dominance and Satan's allies. May I remind us, just a little footnote, a little parenthetical footnote, that means that Jesus Christ is in control. He has the power over all of the demons in Washington. And I believe we're faced with, ladies and gentlemen, a demonic control atmosphere in Washington, D.C. I believe it's as a result of the demonically controlled mindset of the lost uh, socialist uh, Marxist Democrats that's causing the heartache and the heartbreak to literally tear down the foundation of our nation. We need to recognize as Christians that we have the authority and the power through Jesus Christ to pray in the name of Jesus that all of those demons of hell be canceled and be uh, concluded that he would allow his president that he placed in office to have the say-so in what's being done today. I don't know about you, but we need to pray every day for him, for his insight and for his wisdom. We need to pray every day for his insight and his wisdom, his protection, that he can be protected to continue to do what God has placed him to do in that office. Did I say he's the perfect man? No. Did I say that he's a man without sin? No. But did I say that I believe God has so uh, supernaturally intervened with his divine intervention and placed him there? Did I say that we need to recognize that in Jesus Christ, he is above all of the principalities and the powers, even shifty shift, doesn't have enough power to thwart the will of God in what's taking place in this old world today. May I remind us, Jesus is enthroned above all spiritual seats of all satanic demonic power. Satan is no match for the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. It should cause every saint of God, every Christian to rejoice in the realization that whatever we face, whatever dangers and darkness and difficulties and devastation that we may face, Jesus Christ is greater than all. Absolutely. There's no more of what we can do, but what Christ can do in and through us. There's no name, no person, no king, no president, no prince, no potentate that can be named uh, that is greater than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is in control of this old world today. Paul prays for them to know more of Christ's person revealed, more of Christ's provision realized, and more of Christ's power recognized. And in verse 22 and 23, more of Christ's position reverenced. More of Christ's position reverence. I don't believe as Christians today, we recognize and understand that we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We do not recognize and reverence him as we ought even as Christians today. Paul prays that the saints at Ephesus will know more of the position of Jesus Christ. What is his position? He's King of kings and Lord of lords. He's not the old man upstairs. He's not the uh, holy horseshoe, the divine rabbit's foot, where we can just demand that he give us something. That's not what Paul is pointing out here in the power of Jesus and who he is. He is the ruler of all. He is not just a uh, uh, prophet, as the uh, Islamics call him. As Muhammad said, not greater than Jesus. In fact, in all of the study of Islam, Muhammad is a prophet, Jesus was a prophet, they're side by side, there's neither of them that's any stronger, they're any greater than the other, and that's simply contrary to the word of God. Jesus Christ is created control in the head over the church. Jesus Christ is head over all creation, he is head over the church. Our churches go amiss today. We set up the plans and the programs, and we prognosticate on what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. 
rather than letting the Lord Jesus Christ be on the throne, letting Jesus Christ be head of the church. There are multitudes of religious denominations today, but Christ is the head of his church. Not man, but Christ, his body. He's not the head over Islam or the cults or the religions of the world, but he's the head over his body, the church. And without the head, the body is useless, hopeless, and helpless. Christ is the head of all, or he's not head at all. We need to understand what the Apostle Paul is saying here, which is the verse 23, which is the body, his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Jesus is in all the sphere, if you will. When I'm teaching Christology in the college, I point out that he's in fills the sphere, the whole universe. There's no place you can go that Christ is not there. You can't hide from him. You can't run from him. He's ever-present, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful. It's Jesus Christ, the King of kings. And that's the one the Apostle Paul is praying that the believers at Ephesus might know and know more intimately. There are multitudes of the denominations out there today in religions, but they cannot compete with Jesus Christ as the head of the church. We can hardly grasp the thought. We cannot comprehend the vastness, the fullness of Christ. He is all in all. The question begs to be asked and answered. Have you said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord? In a moment, we're going to have an invitation. The invitation is very, very simple. Very forthright. I believe it's time the church of the Lord Jesus Christ stop playing church. I believe it's time we get real with what we're doing in these last dark, difficult days before the church is raptured out. Once the rapture comes, it's too late. It's too late. Next thing on the calendar of God, theologically, eschatologically speaking, is the rapture of the church, the sudden seizure where the body of Christ, those who said yes to Jesus Christ, are suddenly seized, snatched out of this old world. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort ye one another with these words. It should be a word of comfort and encouragement to realize that's the next thing on the calendar of God. But ladies and gentlemen, listen. When the rapture of the church takes place, the Holy Spirit of God will have been taken out of this world. The man of sin, the Antichrist, will step on the scene. He will rude, rule the world with an iron fist. It'll be too late to say, I want to go to church. It'll be too late to say, I need to say yes to Jesus. It'll be too late to say, I want to read the Bible. It'll be too late to say, I want somebody to pray for me. It'll be too late, too late, eternally too late. The opportunity is now. The Holy Spirit of God is wooing and calling now. God's calling and God's wooing, wooing is to all. Some will say yes and some will say no. How will you respond to the wing of the Holy Spirit today? Will you say yes to his call unto salvation? Listen very carefully. Salvation, getting saved, doesn't mean, as some people misunderstand it. If a person gets saved, many times they're worried that I like to give up my friends and I like to give up all of this and all of that and the other. No, you won't. If it's true salvation, you won't have to give up anybody. They'll give you up. <laughs> all your old buddies that drink with you, they'll walk away. All your old buddies that want to uh, be, get you involved in all of the sin of the world, they'll leave. But we'll have that close, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. Would you stand please?